Cool. Can we begin, Tristan? Yeah, uh, I'm going to give folks a couple minutes to just file in. All the attendees are coming in. All right, Georgia, I think we can get started. Cool. All right. Again, just saying, how I'm a Taki Ape, honey, watch stay. Won't be like Wakantan, Katadashila, you know, Maka say, hello, my relatives. It's a good day. Give thanks to grandfather, grandmother, and all sacred things as we are getting ready to embark in what I believe will be a sacred dialogue. So, welcome to Fuck the Transactional mobilizing power for transformational healing in black and indigenous communities. And I am so humbled and honored to be able to say that some of my heroes and sheroes are also my homies. And we have a very distinguished panel here with y'all today. So uh, let me pass it on to Sister Tristan, who's gonna do a few housekeeping things before we jump into introductions. Awesome, thank you, George. Yeah, my name is Tristan Williams. I'm the development manager here at Courage. Um, I'm gonna try to keep this super short so we can get into the conversation. We only have about an hour together. Um, but firstly, this is a webinar. So if you're attending as a guest, we can't see you, we can't hear you. Relax, enjoy, uh, enjoy the conversation. Uh, we do have the chat open, which I see some of y'all are already active in there. You're more than welcome to chime in there with comments. Um, George, who is the ED of Courage, uh, who you just heard from, he's gonna lead the discussion, but we are gonna save about 15 minutes at the end of the program for y'all to ask questions. So there is a Q&A function. You should see it at the bottom um, on your menu. You can uh, ask questions there and we will see them. Um, I'm also gonna be monitoring the chat. So if your question ends up there in case uh, or instead, then that should be fine too. And last point of housekeeping, if you need or want closed captioning, there is also a closed captioning button where you can turn on the live transcript. Um, it's a little button that says CC. Um, so yeah, that's all our housekeeping. Uh, I'll hand it back over to George to do introductions. Right on. Let me begin with our sister, Alicia Garza. Alicia is the principal of Black Futures Lab, author of The Purpose of Power and co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Global Network, and she is unapologetically building Black power from the ground up. So thank you, Alicia. Let me introduce Brother Sean Genright. I, I really kind of refer to Brother Sean Genright as a sort of our resident scholar um, and uh, really archivist of the healing justice movement and framework, man, and really how we build a healing foundation to build healthier movements. And then of course, last but certainly not least, our loved one, Brother Edgar Villanueva, uh, Edgar, man, Edgar is the principal at Decolonizing Wealth Project and Liberated Capital, and he is the author of Decolonizing Wealth, which, man, is like a groundbreaking book that I really put in kind of like the trajectory of like Black Awakenings in Capitalist America, uh, as well as the revolution will not be funded beyond the nonprofit industrial complex, and now comes Decolonizing Wealth. You better ask somebody. And let me also just share a little bit about Brother Sean Jenner. I'm sorry, I skipped that part, but Brother Sean is CEO of Flourish Agenda. He's a professor of education and Africana studies at San Francisco State University. And of course the homie. So we ain't got a whole lot of time y'all. Time is sacred. So let's jump right into it. This is a question for all of you. Um, each of you has really been in the process of release, releasing works that give words of wisdom for creating and sustaining movements. So I wanna just ask each of you to maybe talk a little bit about what you see as being some of the obstacles to really building substantive, robust movements as it relates to your work. And let's go ahead and begin with Sister Alicia. Well, it's really good to be here with y'all. And George, you know, you already know, you already know. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a few barriers to building the kinds of movements that we deserve. Um, but one big one, I think, is um, that honestly, we could do a much better job at figuring out how to be more porous. Of course, there's a lot of reasons, right, why we are as contained as we are. Um, one of those big reasons is because we've been attacked by the state every time, right, we've been able to build um, robust, rigorous movements, and um, they have been intentionally uh, derailed uh, 
uh, um, uh, intervened upon. And certainly um, there has been intentional efforts to create chaos, destruction and confusion all the way up to uh, and ending with the, the murder and the caging of um, some of our greatest leaders. And at the same time, as we understand that as a strategy that the state employs to keep us from being as powerful as we can be. Um, we also have to understand that the, the solution to that, right, is to be able to be resilient in the face of crisis. And being resilient in the face of crisis must also mean that there are many entry points for people to join and help us build movements. And as long as we continue to be contained in small groups that think the same, do things the same way, uh, share the same methodology, right? Um, then we actually limit ourselves from being able to have the scope and the scale and the reach that we need to. And remember, we are trying to build movements, not in the dozens, not in the hundreds, not even in the thousands, but we need to build a movement of millions. And so in order to do that, our groups, our communities, um, our organizing efforts need to have more porosity. They need to be able to um, accept people at different levels of consciousness, different levels of experience. Um, and also we have to be able to figure out how we navigate conflict around those differences at the same time. Uh, one of the things that I feel is deeply, deeply important is not the weird bipartisanship conversations that we hear some people having, right? That is an outdated framework that I don't think is uh, relevant or useful, because in some ways it, it, it tells us not to push people around the ways that we seek to make change. But one thing we do have to figure out is how do we navigate disagreements? How do we navigate conflict in such a way where we can commit ourselves to making it to the other side together and, and really determining, right? Um, you know, who needs to be there on the other side? Uh, really making sure that we're clear about who are the people that just get on our nerves because we're so different and who are the people who are actually our enemies that we need to fight and oppose uh, and neutralize, right, and, and curtail their efforts. And sometimes I think we get all of those things mixed up because we haven't quite learned, right, how to embrace that porosity, especially given um, the ways in which we've been attacked. So I'll, I'll kick off the conversation there. Right on. Thank you, Alicia. Brother Sean, same question. Well, I first want to say uh, to what Alicia said, let the church say, amen. That's right. Um, and, 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 and George, as I said earlier, it's, this is not a small world. It's a big family. So it's good to see Alicia and Edgar uh, and be here uh, with, with uh, my comrades. Um, you know, I think the, you know, one of the biggest barriers, I think that oftentimes uh, my experience in this work for years um, is that we we don't oftentimes recognize the ways in which these systems and uh, of oppression inflict harm. Uh, there's not just blocked opportunities. It's not just uh, the removal of wages. It's not just lack of health care. It's not just a lack of quality schools. That these institutions and the embedded white supremacy in these institutions inflict psycho spiritual harm. That I I I. I at the root of some of the most toxic ways in which uh, we, the toxic ways that we see in our movements that we haven't yet figured out how we as movement builders and leaders uh, create the spaces for our own healing and, and restoration and well being. And without that, right, if, if we can, if we're not recognizing that, that that the, the that our addiction to frenzy, right, that our ability to always be think we're busy, that if we that our that our uh, the way in which our, our mental models of thinking about um, always fighting but never dreaming, right? That these ways of a, of engaging in our movements sometimes become more, even more toxic uh, for our own well being, and so we have to figure out. I think those of us who've been engaged in this is those spaces of dreaming and healing and imagination that that. Uh, much of our work has been so much and necessarily so of sort of of fighting and ending misery and suffering, which we need to do. That is an important part of our work. But my ancestors who were enslaved also said that part 
of my engagement in freedom is not just ending slavery, but actually embracing and dreaming and working for freedom and something that didn't exist. And so I think there's two sides of our equation in creating justice. It's fighting, resisting, and confronting, but also dreaming and imagining, which the research suggests that that both of these things together form the elixir of well-being that we need to create the world and systems that we know can better serve our communities. So for me, um, finding those spaces of healing, being in community, rejoicing in our joy, uh, but also fighting and resisting those things that harm us are critically important in our, in our movement building work. And I'll stop there. Right on, thank you, Sean. Brother Edgar, same question. Um, I feel I'm very aligned in the spirit and the anointing as, as my friends and colleagues here. You know, I work in the space um, mostly of moving money and, and trying to resource movements to address the injustice that's within philanthropy, but also more broadly in financial markets, just the lack of capital that we have in our communities as a result of history and systemic racism that has pro prohibited us from those same types of opportunities. The, the biggest obstacle that I find in my work is, you know, be just wanting to say white supremacy, which impacts everything, but it's the, um, the, the fear of losing control that the folks in power have. Um, uh, you know, we see a lot more resources beginning to flow to our communities. We see these new ideas around participatory grant making, but at the end of the day, in, in most of the cases, there's still a white person who calls the shot and signs their paychecks and decides whether or not the lights are on. And, uh, you know, there's a there's a quote from my sister, Vanessa Daniel, that I say all the time is that the cornerstone of white supremacy is the need to dominate and control and that freedom and liberation can never be built from that cornerstone. And so the only way to get to freedom for all people is to lay down a new cornerstone that is about equity and sharing. So our work is really pushing beyond the sprinkling of dollars and you know, pat on the back to folks who stepped up this past year, but that's only the beginning of what needs to happen to really lose control and to actually redistribute wealth um, uh, in, into the hands of, of movement and to black and brown people. Within the movement spaces where I'm working, um, I have experienced that the same and especially, um, uh, you know, in indigenous communities where I spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, just want to underscore what Shauna said here, the need for healing. And um, our people have not had resources before, oftentimes. And as we are beginning to build power, have some resources, think about infrastructure, we have to push back on those internalized, um, colonized ways of being and modeling. We've never seen a world that's decolonized. And so often we begin to take on those same types of lateral oppression um, behaviors. And so we're trying to undergird everything that we're, we're doing in addition to moving money to community is uh, we're trying to provide those healing spaces. And we ourselves as leaders in these bridge positions are trying to really undergird and support ourselves through healing. We have an indigenous healer on our staff who holds ceremony with us. And it's, it's something that is necessary and is required for us to be able to, to continue this fight. So those are a couple of things that I wanted to name. Man, I think that's the perfect segue, you know, as you kind of touch on sort of the internalized colonialism, internalized racism, and how sometimes we are oftentimes our, our, our own worst enemies, you know what I'm saying, is I think the perfect segue to the question I have for Sean, which is really about how does individual healing connect to our movements? I know this is something we've talked to, you know, talked about a lot, Sean, but I'd love for you to kind of dive in for that. Yeah, audience. yeah, you know, one of, one of the things, George, I've seen, um, is that you know sometimes we can fight white supremacy but reproduce patriarchy and we could uh fight patriarchy uh but we you know uh reinforce uh homophobia or and sexism in our work and and largely it's because i think oftentimes we haven't created the spaces for people to heal from the ways in which they've been harmed um, and as a result, we bring these in, we bring these issues into our organizations and we bring them into our movements. I mean, for example, um, this idea that you can sort of be dedicated to the movement, dedicated to building your organization, but your family is in, in, is in shambles, right? Your relationships are in shambles. You haven't restored that harm that happened to you when, when your, your father or your mother abandoned you, right? These are issues that 
that in our communities are real, man. And without reconciling that, I'm not talking about mental health. I'm not even talking about self-care. What I'm talking about is saturating our, our movements, our people in our communities with opportunities to restore themselves from these forms of harm. And, and so the relationship is when we have healed people, we have healed movements. The relationship is, is when we focus on the restoration and the well-being of our institutions and our communities, we have stronger, more vibrant movements and organizations. Without it, what happens is, and I, and I can point, I'm not going to point to examples, right? But our organizations implode. We fight against each other. We try to take each other out. We call out each other when we're on the same side because we're wounded, right? And and that's a and 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 I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't hold people accountable, but but some forms of our accountability stems from deep hurt and wound dis and distrust. And the spaces for us to talk about that, the spaces for us to reconcile that, the spaces for us to heal that become the Achilles heel of our movements and our organizations. And so when we engage and create resources, so, so um, I was on a, 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 a call yesterday or a Zoom yesterday with these foundations and who were, were wrestling with this question about you know, communities that are harmed. I'm like, we gotta create spaces for people to, to have sabbaticals. We have to create mental health supports for people who are on the front lines. We have to create more general operating support and foundations need to ask whose money is this in the first place, right? So anyway, I'm kind of rambling here, man, but the relationship is that we have to create those spaces for individuals, for organizations and for our collective communities to reconcile their, their, their wounds and to heal. And when we do that, we have stronger organizations, more vibrant and more vibrant movements. That's right, man. Colonialism is a hell of a drug, right? <laughs> Toxic drug, right? Toxic drug, man. I, I often like to say that, you know, um, unresolved trauma brings a whole lot of drama into movements. But I really like the way you framed it from more of an asset mapping approach that, you know, healed individuals create healed movements. So thank you for those powerful words, Brother Sean. And um, Sister Alicia, this kind of brings in, and this is a nice segue into the question we have for you, which is really, you know, in your introduction to the purpose of power, you talk about your experience with movement building, how it quote unquote toughened your skin and softened your heart. And I wanted to ask if you could kind of talk a little bit more about that duality. There was also another thing that you talked about in the book that I think is a really important distinction, maybe perhaps not a duality, but the difference between uh, power and empowerment. And I was wondering if you could really kind of talk about those two things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let me start there uh, because I think it's an important framework for us to embrace. And I really want to appreciate y'all for purchasing the book. Um, the paperback version is updated and we're feeling really good about um, putting a tool in the hands of our folks to um, either strengthen your long-term practice or help you figure out where to start. So, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time on this question because coming up in organizing work, having done this work for the better part of 20 years, um, I think sometimes we throw around words and we don't always know what they mean, much less know how to integrate it into our practice. And so in credit, especially recently, there's been a lot of conversation uh, in philanthropy and other places about power. Are you building power? Are you um, changing the relationships of power? Um, but often what I find that people are actually talking about, what they actually want you to be doing is empowerment work. And that is a, a framework that is kind of rooted in um, how people see our work from the outside, which is generally charity work, right? You're doing something for the less fortunate. And so empowerment then, or power, I think, um, is often being confused with empowerment. And empowerment, the way that I see that um, in its most banal form, is essentially making people feel good in, uh, in their current circumstances. 
right? Um, so making people feel good about themselves in their current circumstances. And so when we talk about uh, uh, empowering Black folks or empowering Indigenous people, right? Empowering queer people. Um, we're not often talking about systems change or rule change. We're talking about making people feel good about the, the current state of things. But power is actually something that's fundamentally different. And I do believe that you can be empowered from building and wielding and transforming power, but you have to actually build and change power in order to get there. Um, and so power is something quite different. Power is actually the ability to make the rules and to shape the rules. And there's many forms of power that we as movements need to be building at the same time. And this is a framework that comes from my sister, Ai Jen Pu, who's the director of the uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance. And she says at any given time, there's at least five forms of power that we need to build. Power is about um, deciding where resources go and where they don't go, right? Edgar, this is your entire right, thesis, right? Who gets to decide where resources go and where they don't go and why? Um, power is about being able to decide who represents you and with what agenda, right? That's, that's what it means to build political power. Uh, power is the ability to stop bad things from happening. Right, that's disruptive power. Uh, power is the ability to uh, decide who gets to tell the story of who we are and who we can be together, right? Um, but power is also about um, being able to levy consequences when people disappoint you. Um, and that is actually my favorite piece of talking about power because I think it often shakes people up a little bit, right? When people are empowered, right? That is a good thing, but are people, scared of your empowerment? <laughs> Are people worried about, well, if I don't make sure that they get what they need, something's going to happen to my ability to make these decisions, to move this money, right? <laughs> um, to, uh, 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 sh to show up moving this agenda. Um, and so if we're not understanding the difference and also the relationship between power and empowerment, our strategies get really confused, right? If our mission and our goal is to empower people, but not to change the rules that organize people's lives, um, then we have a huge disconnect between uh, having the, the kind of impact that we need to have. And why this is relative to um, a conversation about power and philanthropy, I think, um, and Edgar, you can either back me up on this or check me on this, is that you know, oftentimes when we are trying to transform how power operates, uh, that is really where the most disruption comes from. People go, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't want you to do that. We didn't want you to actually change who's making the rules. We didn't want you to actually challenge the people who are making the rules. We just wanted to make sure that y'all were present and feeling good about being present, <laughs> right? So that's, that's how we see the difference there. And I'll say honestly, George, this question about how the movement has and movement building has toughened my skin and softened my heart um, really has to do with this question of how we show up for healing um, in conflict, right? It has to do with this question of how we treat each other along the way. Um, it also has to do with this question of how we show up for each other or don't. And as I said, this is, you know, Black Lives Matter is not my entry point to this work. In fact, right. I had been doing organizing work locally and nationally long before uh, Black Lives Matter was even uh, a, a, a whisper. Um, and I will say that I've always been happy and satisfied being an unknown local organizer, helping people to see their own power and wield it. And when that um, um, visibility expanded and increased, people change. You know, I know I've changed, but also people around me change in how they relate to me, um, in how in what they ask me for, um, in what they demand from me, and how they hold me accountable, and what they hold me accountable for. Now, one of the great things about being an organizer is that if you're really doing that work, then you're in community and people do come and collect you when you need to be collected and you welcome that, right? People claim you, they say, no, you're ours and you out there and you acting up and we need you to rein it in a little bit. But then there are some times when people want you to be accountable to them, 
but you have no relationship. And I always say accountability is grounded in relationship. I can't tell somebody you need to be worried about what I think about you if we don't know each other. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is when people um, um, uh, and our movements and our work actually breaks through, right? There's both a lot of yearning right, which is necessary and needed. We all want to reach as many people as possible. We all want the things that we care about to be on everybody's radar. But then there is also a sense of, um, uh, because we have been without for so long, um, we can do this thing where we try to pull people back into being small rather than create the conditions for all of us to be big together. There is so much room for us to be expansive and to expand our reach and ourselves. And so for me, I've had to learn um, uh, not to be bitter in that, right? At first, it really impacted me. I'm sensitive. <laughs> I'm very sensitive. I'd be like, what you mean? Why are you talking about me like that? You do have my number though. You do. I've been in the same place. My number ain't changed in 20 plus years. And then I realized actually what's happening here is that this is a function, right? Of um, um, some of the work we still have to do. And so I can't let that make me bitter about the work or the people in it. And we do know some of our comrades, right? Have left our work because they've been hurt, right? They fundamentally have been hurt and they haven't been able to resolve that for themselves or with, with us. Um, I don't wanna do that. And I encourage all of us to figure out, right? Through doing that internal work and doing that community work, how is it that we can um, still stay strong and whole in the face of adversity, not shrink from it, but also not internalize it? Right. This is also a part of the process. This work is hard. Transforming ourselves, each other and our world is hard. We're going to make mistakes. But the important thing here is to have a tough skin, figure out what gets in and what stays out, but also keep your heart soft. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, I know I've shared with you um, privately, but I'd like to just kind of say publicly too, just um, kind of the power and grace in which you've navigated those spaces. I mean, a lot of people don't realize how long you've been an organizer and an activist prior to the movement for Black Lives. And, you know, I just know from, you know, social media, seeing how folks would sometimes try to come at you, like you were accountable to people who didn't even know you. And the way you navigated that space was just so beautiful and powerful. And I also know, regardless of how much grace that you um, approached it with, um, you know, and strength, because sometimes I saw you just ch chin check fools the way they needed to be chin check, you know what I mean? Um, which I really appreciated as well. Um, how much it takes a toll on you, because we're human and just chips away at you, you know what I mean? Um, and I also want to say too, that you're also a source of inspiration, because um, for the last 10 years, we've had this concept that I've been describing as sort of a concept of, as an alternative to the gang injunction zone that Courage was born out of, the youth empowerment zone. And now we're going to change it to the youth power zone hey. because of Alicia Garza. So we're going to give you credit for that. But Love yes, that. the youth power zone because of that distinction that you made and so powerfully articulated. Thank so thank you. Thank you, um, Brother Edgar. All right. So how do we engage with whiteness and capitalism in a way that allows us to move beyond our collective trauma and build transformative relationships with folks who we've you know, historically benefited, who have basically historically benefited from our trauma. People have profited from our trauma and oppression. It's, it's hard, it's hard. Um, you know, I, I, what comes to mind for me in that question, what I pull on because I organize in white rich spaces most of the time, that's most of the day, that's where I am. And what I pull on is both healing to uh, that I do in private so that I'm strong enough to be able to go into the, the belly of the beast and do this work. And I also have to really exercise a lot of what Alicia just said around grace. And I remember where I came from, right? Like my first day in the movement, right? I, I wasn't the same person that I am now. Um, I didn't grow up in a progressive family. I grew up in the South in a right wing evangelical church. When I first uh, registered to vote when I was 18, I registered to be Republican because that was just what our church told us to do. Right. And I remember when I began to get politicized and stumble into um, movement spaces, how I was treated um, by by some kind of shunned and called out and embarrassed because I didn't know the answer to every question. I wasn't able to keep up with the language. 
um, and by others who took me under their wings and taught me, right, and showed me the, the way. And um, a lot of people don't know that side of me. They only see progressive Edgar, right? But we are all growing. And so I try to see in every single person um, the ability to evolve and to grow and to, to ask myself, do I have grace to tolerate this person at some level if today is their first day in the movement? Um, so I really just appreciate what you all have said about making space for folks. And let's be clear, there's a time to fight. There's a time to fight. And uh, when someone has their... Uh, you know, boot on the neck of our people, we're going to take to the streets and fight that. But there's also a time to come to the table and try to see each other through the indigenous kind of worldview of all my relations and uh, and and entertain um, the opportunity to to educate, to bring people um, into an understanding of what's going on. And that that's hard work to do, right? Like you have to do a lot of healing. Everybody ain't able to do that. And some days I'm not able. There are absolutely days where I'm like, I can't do it today, right? Um, but um, for me, it's being able to transcend for a moment of when I have the opportunity to have the conversation with certain folks is to try to put aside uh, the title, who they are, their whiteness, their wealth, their uh, political affiliation to just see them as a human. And it's organizing one-on-one, right? Like what do we do when we're trying to influence someone's heart and mind as we try to speak to their self-interest? Self so I spend a lot of time talking about what's going on in Black and Native communities, but in those spaces, I'm trying to make the case that white supremacy is killing them, that it's hurting their families, right? That they're not benefiting ultimately from these systems that we saw in, over the last year, the fragility of the of our economy, right, of our healthcare system. And so if we can get folks to tap into that, that is the work to be done. I also bring in an element of the spiritual. Y'all, what we have that a lot of them don't have is culture, spirituality. They've had it, but they've lost it because of white supremacy, because of sort of white dominant ways of being. They are um, empty inside. <laughs> I hate to make this blanket statement about all white people, but um, child, I'm telling you, I go into some of these spaces and I just channel a little bit of my heart and my feeling and my emotion and passion in a way that lets them feel a little something. And maybe I don't have all the data. Maybe I don't have the nicest PowerPoint. But when they feel the touch of that spirit, it awakens something that folks will want more. And so that's that's my approach. Um, and I think, you know, what? maybe this is old age um, <laughs> Uh, for me, and I don't, I don't think I'm becoming less radical, but I've come to understand some stuff working in the nonprofit sector my entire life. You know, I, I was sort of like, I sort of like demonize other sectors. I'm like, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And working in philanthropy, I was a good guy and corporate America was the bad guy. And let's be clear, there, there, there's good and bad people all across, like in every sector, there are good and bad people. And I've come to understand that in some of these places where I'm working, again, People need to be held accountable, institutions need to be held accountable. But in some of these places where I'm working outside of the nonprofit sector, there are actually organizers, they wouldn't maybe call themselves that, but they're good people who are enlightened, who have an analysis about power and race, working inside of these institutions, trying to um, disrupt, trying to, trying to do good. So I think we do have to shift our holier than thou, um, sometimes point um, perspectives that we hold in, in movement to exercise grace and understanding and realizing that we we all have fallen and come short have come short of the glory right so where's the opportunity for us to just model our own vulnerability and just create space to to love you know when we're over here a movement being all critical nasty towards one another think that we know better. who wants to be a part of that party right like but if we're showing that we are free that we love each other that we are connected we are exercising joy that is going to be the space that attracts people to want to be a part of that and so i just try to hold on to that and um it's hard it's, it's really hard um on a lot of days let me tell you but um, it doesn't mean that I subscribe to capitalism, that I, um, you know, I don't speak truth to power, but in certain places where we're organizing, there's a different approach and it has to be that we come to the table and see people first um, as, as, uh, as uh, not a person with a point of view, but as a person that has feelings, emotions, and a spirit that maybe um, we can kind of co connect around some some um, part of our humanity, right, where we've all suffered loss and experienced um, pain in our lives to just open the door for a conversation about healing. So all my relations, that's kind of the, the what I hold every day. Oh, man, um, Edgar, I think you already kind of jumped ahead already to the, 
to the last question I had, man, but there were so many powerful points that I want to kind of um, piggyback on. So one is, um, you know, the way we can kind of sometimes get stuck in our trauma. And I think, you know, um, that really kind of points to why it's so critical for us to be able to kind of facilitate and have a foundation of healing for our movements, because who wants to be a part of that movement, you know, where everybody's stuck in their trauma, it's like a hamster wheel. And or, or do you want to be in that one where we're liberated to basically have permission and compassion where we have we celebrate our joy and love because that's an act of resistance for black and indigenous people you know what i mean so um so many powerful points that you touched upon um but it, and, and such a appropriate way to really kind of lead into the next question for all of you and we'll start with brother sean um what do you see as our inherent strength as black and indigenous people and in what ways what are ways that we can kind of lean in to really make space for our collective healing? Yeah, no, um, I, I want to say to Edgar as well as let the church say <laughs> amen, right? Like, right. like it's right on, right on target, man. And, and um, in response to your question, um, in, in the book that I have coming out next year, I talk about four pivots that we need to make um, as individuals and as and as communities so that we have more beautiful movement building. And the first pivot, I call it a pivot because if you do this much of a change, um, you end up in an entirely different di direction. You don't have to shift, it doesn't take a lot of effort. A pivot is a subtle change that puts you in an entirely different di direction. The first pivot is a pivot from lens, which is in a look out at the world, an analysis of the world and an examination of the issues that we need to face to a mirror. And so we need more mirror work. Mirror work is when we all got up this morning and looked in the mirror, the mirror didn't tell you the damn lie. The mirror told you the truth. But sometimes we, we don't engage in mirror work with each other and ourselves. So mirror work is a deeper reflection. And that's hard work, as Edgar said, and as Alicia said, that is hard work to do our own self-examination about how I'm feeling, about my own insecurities, my own vulnerabilities. But practicing mirror work makes us stronger, more vibrant, and gives a stronger movement building. And the second pivot is a pivot in our relationships. We know that what you already said, you know, F the transactional, but moving from transactional relationship to transformative relationships, which are based on our humanity, right? Or based on vulnerability and empathy and sharing who we are as human beings. Uh, the, and the, the third pivot is a pivot from focusing on engaging in problem solving to possibility creation. And I learned this from my graduate students and they taught me that oftentimes the greatest casualty of oppression is the inability to dream beyond it. And as a result, what we tend to do is continue to be locked and engaged to fighting and ending oppression, which is necessary, but not dreaming and imagining and engaging and creating the kind of conditions and, issues and institutions you want to see. And then the last pivot is a pivot from hustle to flow. And this is that we have to uh, re we have to dis uh, remove ourselves from an addiction to frenzy, which comes from white supremacist capitalist culture that values human beings by what you can earn or produce. Uh, so when we when we shift from hustle and frenzy uh, to flow, it means that we are intentionally taking the time uh, uh, to do the deep change, right? We're, th that we're setting realistic timelines for ourselves. We're, we're making sure that we're conscious that we're not ruled by our to-do list. These are small pivots that over time have a profound impact on our own well-being as well as well as our movements. Right on. Thank you, Brother Sean. Uh, Sister Alicia, same question. You know, I really feel pretty strongly um, that, um, well, number one, cosign everything, Dr. G, that you said. And I, I really want to kind of hone in on this piece around our freedom dreams. Mm. Um, you know, we it, part of what it means to become more porous as movements um, is to lead not with the problems, but to lead with what it is that we're fighting for and what it means to resolve those problems, how it feels, right? So that we can have a visceral sense of, what, uh, what it tastes like, what it smells like, right? How it feels on our skin, how it feels in our spirits. And, you know, from um, years of doing this work, I realized that um, so much of where I've been grounded for so long has been in like 
um, taking a scalpel to understanding the problem, as opposed to being rigorous about articulating what it is that we're building towards. And I think we're seeing this in recent conversations, right? When we're talking about um, defund the police, right? Which I love because it's one of those things that makes people kind of clutch their pearls and they start wringing their hands. And well, what are we gonna do if we don't? Well, let's talk about it, right? <laughs> let's talk about what it might look like to seek safety and justice differently. Um, what it might look like, right? To have accountability without punishment and really push ourselves to um, be able to create that picture in people's minds. Because frankly, George, that is what wakes people up and gets them out of bed when they don't want to. Um, that is what gets people out into the streets when there's a global pandemic. Um, that is what gets people to put down their everyday responsibilities, right? And say, I'm gonna take an extra step. I'm gonna do more. I'm gonna uh, uh, push with more risk. And I wanna tell this story, um, and you'll forgive me for this for a bunch of reasons, but I'm gonna tell it anyways. <laughs> there's there's a, a moment um, where that pivot happened for me um, in my life that I wanna share with folks. So I don't know if folks remember this, but um, uh, when Van Jones became the green czar uh, in the Obama administration, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> There was both simultaneously, you know, I'm gonna keep it 100%. So I'm just, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was both simultaneously a lot of like, whoa, one of us is next to President Obama advising him about what he needs to be doing. And I think there was some um, hateration, right? People, are, who does he think he is? And there was a lot of transformations that were happening in that moment. Um, and I remember that Van invited a group of us to come to the White House uh, to talk about right, our ideas for how it was that we could fundamentally um, reshape the economy. And he invited a bunch of us from different sectors that worked on a bunch of different issues. And I remember going into this uh, office with this big, wide, wooden table, and there was all of us sitting around this table. And Van and uh, Sister Melody Barnes had legal yellow legal pads in front of them and pens. And I'm convinced today uh, that he set us up for this, but it was actually a really good lesson. <laughs> and he said, all right, y'all, we have such and such billion dollars that we can work with. So what should we do with it? And the first thing that people started doing was talking about the problems. We don't have enough housing, you know, um, our people don't have jobs, you know, too many of us are locked up. And he was like, yeah, 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 I get all that. I get all that. I'm right there with you. What do we do about it? We got billions of dollars on the table. Here's our legal pads. We are ready to take these solutions to the people that can make it happen. What do y'all want to do? And I will tell you that everybody at that table was quiet. Every single person, mm. every single one of us was quiet, including myself. And I remember walking out of that office that day saying, I'm never going to do that again. I am always going to be very, very clear at any given moment. This is what we're building towards. This is what we want to see, not just in terms of like stop the harm, but it's here's how you create something better, right? Here are the building blocks to that. Um, this is what we want you to build and this is how we want you to do it. Now, whatever you think about Van Jones, take that out of the story. There's a bigger a uh, uh, question here, right? Which is how much time do we invest in our freedom dreams? And how much do we communicate our freedom dreams um, with the people that we're trying to organize and bring into movement? And I will tell you, whenever people try to organize me into something, if I can't see where we're headed, I'm not interested in spending my time there. I have so many other things to do, right? That I'm like, oh, I can't see it. I can't feel it. I can't touch it. I'm not sure I'm interested. I don't see the path. There's a lot of people out there that don't do this work every day that feel the exact same way. They think that the problems that exist in our society are fixed. Um, they think that somebody else should take care of it, right? That they don't have any influence or impact over what we can do. But if we start to place people inside of our freedom dreams and ask them to dream with us, 
it's more likely, right? That more people are along for the ride and they're there through the tough stuff because they're holding on to the freedom dream, not the problem. I love that. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I think so much of our energy does get consumed with just trying to deconstruct, dismantle, that we're not actually getting into the weeds of trying to reimagine and really dream what the alternative looks like, the solutions, you know what I mean? And so I think that that's really a, a strategic place to kind of direct our folks, you know what I mean? Um, thank you so much for that. I also really appreciate this concept that you've talked about the movement having to be porous. And I guess what immediately I thought of, you know, for us, you know, um, as indigenous people was the Inipi, the sweat lodge, those grandma and grandpa stones that we put into the fire are these porous lava rocks. Now, if you put in a stone that's not porous, it's not a lava rock, and you put it in the fire, it explodes. But those grandma and grandpas that we put in there, they retain the heat, they glow, and they bring the ancestors in to kind of help, you know, doctor us and heal us when we're in that lodge, you know. So, um, I immediately thought about that and I love this concept of being porous and man, I, I'm gonna have to adapt and borrow that one for sure. Thank you, Alicia. Edgar, take us home, family. You know, one of the, so I think the question we're responding to was just sort of what, uh, what, what's special <laughs> or what are inherent strengths about um, be, being black and indigenous um, towards getting us to a place of healing. You know, I, I think what Alicia just did in terms of be telling that story, I mean, that changed me right there. I, I think that we are inherent, uh, inherently storytellers. Um, we, we have those stories that we pass down through, through our, our families. And it's a superpower that I've learned that um, I've, you know, I think of myself as a storyteller and, and, and writing and, and doing the work that I do. And it has been a powerful tool for transformation. So I think that's something that um, is really important and why our voices and stories need to be told. I'm so freaking inspired right now by what's happening with indigenous folks, native folks right now, and the visibility that we haven't had that we're beginning to experience across politics and the entertainment industry, um, like you name it, like there's just some really badass work that's that's happening. Um, and uh, we got there, we got to the, 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 the victory with the Washington NFL team last year after 30 years of organizing through the power of storytelling. And so, you know, that's what's really required for, for healing. California, you all may know, has the first ever Truth and Healing Council that has ever happened at this scale on this land for Native people ever. It's a five-year process, and it's really going to be a five-year process of storytelling. Folks are going to be grieving um, and sharing stories, but also doing that visioning work around, okay, we're going to get that all out. We're going to document it so that it's not erased. And then we're going to transition to talk about what collective healing looks like and what is the future that uh, Native folks in California need and want to, um, to thrive and to, to be well. And um, we are supporting that by bringing in healers for the tough part, but we're also going to be supporting the storytelling part of that. Um, and it's not just about getting our own healing. I think through our storytelling, through the inspiration of our resistance, I think other folks are going to find their healing and their opportunities to plug in because it's got to be collective. And that's the hard part for me. Honestly, this is where I don't feel very indigenous sometimes, but our teachings um, do say that the oppressor has to be in this circle and for us, for us to all find that healing. And so I, I'm hoping that through the power and, and grace of storytelling that we can find a way to uh, to expand that table and invite those folks in to get their healing as well. So I'll just lift that up. Right on. Thanks. And shout out to my sister Morningstar Galley and all our California native relatives who helped make that happen. Thank you for lifting that up, Edgar. So I'm going to pass it on to Tristan. Tristan is our brilliant, my brilliant colleague. Um, you know, one of our courage staff who helped organize this whole panel, and she's going to take some questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful conversation. I love to be a fly on the wall just to hear y'all speak. Um, we hopefully have time for two. Um, one that I'm going to lift up from the Q&A is how do you form processes of accountability within movement building? How do we move away from individual accounts and find ways to practice transparency and honesty in a healing way? Um, we'll pose that to, to whoever wants to take it. Well, I think I, I'd like, you know, whenever I hear that, this kind of question about accountability, um, I think the way that we do it in a healing way or healing centered way is we reframe the question between what do we need for accountability, but also what do we need for grace? 
right? That, that if, we, if we lean into only accountability, uh, we are being, de we are dehumanizing ourselves. But if we only lean into grace, then we're actually not holding or we're not advocating for the accountability we need. And so the question that I always ask is how am I balancing accountability and grace? At what points do I need to lean into grace? And then at what points do I need to actually be on hold and think more about accountability? So it's a balance. And if we're not struggling with that balance, then I think the default is uh, the term and the engagement and the leaning into accountability. Awesome. Um, let's see how much time we have. Um, a question that we have from, I think, a funder um, is, how do you explain to donors or other people in philanthropy the need to invest in healing and dreaming if they don't think that either of them is work? I guess y'all looking at me since I work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm so over making the case for stuff, you know, <laughs> I'm so for over making the case. I think what's what's shifting in philanthropy right now is, uh, Georgie kind of said this earlier, some of this stuff used to be seen as radical or or, or whatever. Th this is no longer radical. This is this is modern philanthropy. This is what we do. If you're not funding this kind of work, if you if you haven't um, done your own work to open your understanding and to shift your funding practices to support movements, to support Black and Brown people, to support healing, then then your business model is out of date. You're you're not you're not doing best practices. This is the way we do business now in philanthropy. So. Um, so it shouldn't be on the shoulders of movement and, and folks who are already traumatized by this industry to have to make that case to, to folks who are in power. Philanthropists and funders need to do their own work. There are a lot, I mean, resources for days to support learning and understanding um, so that work does not have to be done on the backs of, of movement leaders. Um, and if, if folks need help with that, they can definitely reach out to us at Decolonizing Wealth Project. But this is, uh, it's, it's the most beautiful type of funding that you can do. And in doing so, not only are you supporting healing and liberation in communities, you are supporting your own healing and liberation by moving money as a form of medicine uh, to the right thing. So I'll keep it short and sweet, leave it there. <laughs> Thanks, Edgar. Can I just add? Oh yeah, go ahead. I can really quickly. Um, I feel you, Edgar, in terms of being tired of making the case, but um, you've also done a really great job because here we are having conversations with funders, conversations in philanthropy that were not happening loudly before, and now they are happening quite loudly. Um, I think it's important to also um, remind folks um, of their actual role in movement building. <laughs> and I think one of the conversations that we're often um, not courageous enough about uh, is the conversation about the role of philanthropy, um, ideally in movements, not being to try to dictate the, the, the strategy or the methods, right? But to move resources to where movements are saying they need support. And that conversation can't just happen with uh, uh, grantees. It also has to like echo, right? Amongst uh, those very people, Edgar, that you talked about who are inside of these institutions who do have these frameworks and do want to push and move the needle and are trying to be strategic about it. And I find that too often folks are relying on their grantees to like have these conversations as opposed to saying in partnership with our grantees, right? We're trying to move a strategy inside of philanthropy of how it is that we um, take care of our movements so that they are around for a long time. And I think this is actually a really interesting moment to be having this discussion, particularly because a year ago, right? Before everything kicked off with Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we were starting to go backwards in terms of, um, you know, uh, attention to organizing, what organizing needed to look like, whether or not organizing was effective. And I think we can do a better job of talking about healing, not as separate work, 
from organizing, but as endemic to it, right? Like actually when you're sitting with people at their kitchen tables, when you're talking with people on their porches, when you're um, talking with people behind and between glass inside of facilities, right? That so much of what we're doing there is actually that work, that organizing work where we're connecting with people and, and getting people to take action also requires that we take care of multiple uh, pieces of people's selves. And um, so if we're able to bring that together in a new way and help people understand that, I think that that could be helpful as well. Right on, so I know we're pretty much at time. There's one question that I just really wanna just ask folks from our panel, if you could just try to address like in one sentence, you know what I mean? You know, just one little piece of wisdom to try to answer a piece of advice to help break out of the transaction as a way of kind of closing this panel out since the name of the panel is Fuck the Transactional, right? So why don't we go ahead, start with you, Brother Sean. Um, storytelling, in your next staff meeting, before you jump into the agenda, have everyone go around and tell and share about what's going on in their life right now. Just take some time to be human with each other before you get to the first agenda item. Do that over time, you'll start to melt away in these sort of transformative relationships and create more transform uh, transaction transactional relationship and create more transformative relationships. Solid, thank you, Sean. Alicia. Similarly, um, start off every meeting with, if I had unlimited resources and unlimited power, what would I do with it and how would I do it? Mm. Right on, thank you, Alicia. Edgar. Uh, I think my advice would be outside of work, um, tap into uh, your own healing, your own spirituality. If the only time you're having these types of conversations is at work, that's not enough. We should be having these conversations with our families, with our children and our faith communities. It's got to move from the intellectual process to some type of um, very personal healing uh, transformation that also needs to be happening along the way. Solid. Let me just send lots of love and light to all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Shout out to Tristan for organizing this panel and all the Courage staff who helped support and everybody who joined us. Much love, much light to everybody. As long as we can start to say, fuck the transactional, move from transactional relationships to transformational relationships, it will be a takeover, not a makeover. So peace and taco grease, y'all. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>